Hello, everyone. My name is Koi Vo, Vice President for Industry Relations. I have the privilege of overseeing SCAD Pro, SCAD's in-house design studio and creative consultancy. Welcome to SCAD Future Proof, where you'll see what's next in tech, innovation, and in design. Today's event illuminates the university's cutting edge program and creative career preparation in industrial design, UX design, service design, design management, and advertising. You'll hear from leading industry experts on the future of tech, a curated alumni panel who'll discuss in-demand skills, a SCAD AMP workshop to access the power of communication, and an information session with SCAD admissions to learn more about SCAD, the University for Creative Career. And now for our panel. Welcome panelists. Today we're joined by Grace Dolan, Vice President of Marketing at Samsung Electronics and uh, a panelist at this year's Consumer Electronics Show. Michael Goff, Vice President of Product Design at Uber and Caitlin McGarry, Consumer Technology Editor at Gizmodo. You guys, thank you so much for being here. Um, CSE, uh, CES, I'm sorry, is where the next big tech items and products are revealed every year. Uh, they end up transforming and shaping our world uh, and how we navigate within it. So in the past, companies have revealed autonomous cars, uh, 5G, drones, uh, robot vacuums, which are now obviously fairly commonplace in, in our everyday life. So I, the first question is really to Grace. Um, Grace, the future of gaming and esports was a big push for Samsung at, at CES last year, where Samsung created TVs that better accommodate the gaming experience. Um, this year seems to be an extension of that, with uh, with even more advanced TV tech and, and advanced display capabilities, uh, capacities that create a more immersive viewing uh, experience. When, when developing and marketing these new types of, or expanding these products, how do you keep up with consumer needs and wants? So that's a great question. I think that's that's a question that all of us has, have to ask as manufacturers, um, how to stay ahead of the needs and desires of our consumers. I think um, obviously we, we you know, use a lot of research um, as a first starting point. Um, that's every consumer products company. But I think what is unique about, uh, you know, Samsung is that we also have a lot of user behavioral data from our devices. And what we basically do is we we reach deep in um, and look at that behavior, look how the products are being consumed and we optimize. So, for example, and you brought it up with gaming, um, gaming had a huge surge this past year. Um, we saw the category grow <clears throat> tremendously. I think um, NPT did a did a study and said that now four out of five um, Americans hmm. call themselves gamers. Wow. And what was really interesting about that study was that a lot of it was intergenerational. So a lot of older consumers playing. And we saw all of that. We saw, you know, families coming together, um, playing, playing a lot more. And also for like the hardcore gamers, we saw what they were looking at you know, what inputs they were checking, um, what was important to them to enhance that experience. So one of the things that we launched in response to that was a game bar. Um, and essentially it was one to create a much more flexible environment. So we lost control of our homes this year. Like our dining rooms became nurseries and our, you know, like classrooms and everything else. And so we said, okay, if you want a PC game, can you now PC game in the living room versus in the bedroom? Because you might have lost it to your husband who's working wow. remotely, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the game bar now offers, you know, direct access to the things that matter most, input lag, frames per rate, and you can just check it really quickly, change your aspect ratio so that you can have ultra wide viewing. These were all based on insights that we gathered from using that data coming out of our devices to say, how can we keep optimizing and improving things that are so important to our customers? No, that's that's amazing. And I, I, I experienced it firsthand. I have a nine-year-old son, so I've, I've never played so many video games with him. A lot before. of bandwidth yeah. <laughs> requirements. Yeah, really. um, yep. yep, and you know, building off your experience as a creative and, and marketing leader um, and your experiences this year at the uh, the show, what, is, what do you think is the next big thing that you're seeing in electronics and communication? What, what do you think will we'll end up using the most? 
You know, it's funny because typically, especially in CES, it's such a good representation of, of um, kind of the mindset and the spirit of the consumer electronics industry. We were really, I don't want to say practical, right? But it, there was so much function brought into CES this year. Um, it wasn't just about robots. It was like robots that were emptying the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> not, uh, not what you would have seen in the past necessarily, um, but it was really about recreating um, a sense of support within the home mm -hmm. and showing devices doing so many more things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that is here to stay. Um, so consumers have so many needs. And right now, who knows with... Um, you know, COVID, when we will see the world be properly vaccinated. I think there's going to be a continued focus on making home life easier. And so the devices that, you know, I saw and that continue to come out from companies are devices that are no longer just a refrigerator, but a refrigerator that can tell you what ingredients you're missing and also, you know, tell you what recipes that you should cook based on what's in your fridge. And then also recite the steps of the recipe while you're cooking, because we know that your hands are full and you're watching your kids and doing all this other stuff. Um, and same with our TVs, right? It's not just a TV anymore. It's a, you know, not just the one way kind of consuming shows and movies, but pe people are gaming on it. People are working out on their TVs or using them for video conferencing. They're using them as design pieces. This is a, this is a TV behind me. Um, so yeah, like everything needs to do more. And I think that the companies are, are coming to meet the needs of those, um, you know, multi-purpose requirements of our consumers now. More and more. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an amazing point. It seems like more and more these, these objects, these items in our home become part of the family more and more, such as you're saying that with, with, um, smarter technology, artificial intelligence, and so forth. It seems like it's integrating more seamlessly with, within our domestic uh, realm. I, I kind of want to expand out and, and, and ask Michael, Mike, Michael, what, what are new developments within mobility and transportation that you're excited about? It's interesting because uh, at CES, they always do roll out something cool. There's some, always something flying uh, and, or delivering drinks or, or something. But I'm mostly excited about something that's not sexy, which is intermodal. Kind of drafts off of what Grace said. Uh, we're asking our devices to do more and more. Uh, we're also asking them to be better and better interconnected. Uh, and um, multimodal, specifically in our industry and in transportation, is probably more important than any one piece of transportation. Uh, trains are super efficient. Uh, uh, but you can't get a train to your house. Um, but you can get uh, another mode of transportation and then get to the train. It's always just had so much friction. It's been so difficult to get uh, from point A to point B if you're not near uh, a hub. And so we're changing that right now. Um, throughout the industry, we're getting better and better at weaving together all of the various transportation solutions. So you'll still get an autonomous car at some point or an, an autonomous flying vehicle, uh, but you'll e much, it'll be much more easy to get there uh, using the other transportation modes. Again, not very sexy, um, but super, <laughs> super important. But, you know, very functional. And, and Michael, as far as, you know, developing these technology and then kind of going down the path there, how do you get consumers on board with rolling out these new types of uh, technologies and off products and offerings? You know, it's interesting because uh, that, and CES is a good backdrop for this. There's all the things that we think are going to happen this year. Um, and then there are all the things that happened that you just didn't notice. Uh, and so again, focusing on our industry, one day we woke up and Ubering was just a fact. Like it wasn't, it, it sounded like something that might be interesting or might be cool. And now it, again, sticking with the theme of not sexy, it's boring as hell. It just happens. Like you put the right, right, you don't even think about it anymore. Um, and there was all kinds of technology behind that, but the technology just uh, doesn't um, matter. Uh, but with that said, if uh, we get you comfortable uh, taking that first ride, which by the way, wasn't that easy because we're not supposed to get in strangers' cars. Um, 
Yeah, if we can get you to get into uh, a car with a driver you've never met, we are pretty convinced that we will use very similar techniques to get you into a car that doesn't have a driver. And then if you're getting comfortable with that, we can get you in an airplane that doesn't have a driver. Um, it just kind of proceeds naturally one technological evolution at a time. Right. right. That's, yeah, that's amazing to, to see how human nature adapts to these types of what becomes everyday technology. And and I think it's important you, you're talking about this kind of seamless transition at a certain point, which is great. Um, Caitlin, I, I imagine you're, you, you know, in your your profession, you have to be in the know of what most of these uh, tech uh, organizations are up to. So so what's exciting you? What, what products are exciting you? Well, um, touching on what Grace and Michael were saying, this year we're just seeing so much function, so many practical devices. You know, we're seeing laptops that are faster and more powerful, um, some that don't have fans, you know, things with incredibly long battery life, like just really practical things that now we realize are super important to getting our work done, especially at home. Um, you know, we saw the next generation of Wi-Fi connectivity, like things that are not, as Michael was saying, sexy, like it's just basic tech, but we, we really need this stuff. And I think that's becoming um, a lot more apparent <laughs> these days. Um, but, you know, we also are looking forward, you know, the world is not going to be like this forever, hopefully. Um, so we're looking forward to, as Michael was saying, autonomous cars, you know, new designs and electric cars to make them more prevalent. Um, augmented reality, we're eventually going to see glasses become, you know, a thing that people actually want to buy and not something that creeps people out. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that, but we're definitely all about you know, logical devices this year. <laughs> right, right. Well, and, and for you, it seems like you have this added um, other part of your, your job, which is to write about it, to communicate that to us and, and, and talk about these new, you know, ushering in these new technology. Can you talk to us about that and how you translate what you're seeing and what you're excited about into your writing and, and communicating that to your the consumer? Yeah, um, so it's definitely been a challenge with COVID because because usually I'm able to go places and see things in person. You know, if a company is launching a product or has some new technology to show off, I can go there and physically experience it. So that's definitely been the challenge this year for sure. Um, luckily, I, you know, obviously still get things sent to my house. So when a product is launching, I can test it out for myself. But things that are a little more exciting tech wise, that's not possible right now. But, um, and then in terms of, you know, how we find new tech or, or how we are, you know, how we are informed on new products. Thankfully, a lot of that is cyclical. You know, Samsung has its events. They're usually at the same time every single year, Apple, Google, et cetera. So, um, and they tend not to overlap too much with each other. Obviously they want their own news cycle. So that makes it easier for us. Um, but it, it definitely keeps us pretty busy because the events are, are pretty constant throughout the year. Right, right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot. Um, what was your favorite? Uh, what was your favorite and least favorite product uh, that you've seen or reviewed? And even what's the most outlandish one? If you can share a couple of examples to us. Oh goodness. Okay. Um. So there was a there was a time when um you know just adding Bluetooth connectivity to something made it like a a brand new product that was super exciting for companies to launch didn't really translate that well for for buyers because not everything needs bluetooth so um an example of that was i tested and reviewed a pair of bluetooth socks um which <laughs> which were designed for runners so you know i could see where it was going you know they had um sensors built into the socks that monitored your cadence etc all of this data that runners want and then thanks to your phone but the socks were just incredibly thick wool, like totally not practical for running. Um, so that was that was a little interesting. And the same company released a, a Bluetooth sports bra, which was also, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, so you know, it's always it's always interesting. I, I appreciate that people try, right? Like you never know if it's gonna fail unless you try. You put it out there, see if see if people like it. 
Right. And a lot of times they don't. <laughs> right. Right. Definitely. I mean, I think I think you, you touch upon a lot of really interesting points, especially this this issue with or this point about unveiling. And, you know, obviously we've seen CES move to a virtual platform this year uh, for obvious reasons. And, and, and hopefully I, I would love to see you in person next year in uh, 2022 in Vegas. Grace, you know, this is such a central part of, of what you do. How how have companies adapted to this, uh, this kind of unveiling, this kind of rolling out of new or introduction to new technologies? And and do you anticipate the changes that are, are happening now to respond to this year to, to be permanent or do you see it going back to normal? It was hard. It was hard to roll out our technology this year. I would say that everybody would say that there's a the reason why it's still um, a live event is there's there is a moment when you in, you're introduced to the product. There's a tactile experience, experience with the product, with the product, that's, product so that's so important. Um, I, think um, I think that the CTA, that the CTA and, and manufacturers and did a good job, a good job with the tools with that they the had. Tools that they had. Um, but it's but really it, hard to really understand the products hmm. without you know interacting. I think in the future, we're going to see, um, you know, CES go back to a live event, assuming that we can safely do that. And if not, I, I actually think that there there's a possibility of integrating more AR VR to 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 create even more of that feeling of of really being with the product. Mm -hmm. But we'll see. Let's all keep our fingers crossed that that's not something that we need to do in 2022. Wow. I, I hope it's not here to stay. Um, but I think that the the positive parts of this kind of virtual experience is that so many more folks were able to access this content and these experiences in a way that um, was pretty closed off and limited in the past. And I think that might be here to stay because ultimately it's for our consumers. So it's great to be able to share that innovation, even the high flying jets and stuff, right? That's just fun. Right. Um, it's cool to be able to share it with them um, in an open format. Yeah, I, I mean, to expand your audience sounds like, you know, this was such a great opportunity that that's where one of the big, you know, um, I think positives of what, what's happened this year. So that's that's amazing. And and Michael, how is, who, uh, how is Uber or product designs at Uber changed to accommodate this, this new world that we're in? Are these, and do you think these changes are gonna be permanent as well? Um. There'll be aspects of the changes will be more permanent. There has been a debate in the tech industry for uh, as many years as I've been in it about uh, the value of all working in the same place. Uh, and I think we've started to prove uh, how effective we can be as remote workers. Um, we got super, super lucky. Uh, we had all consolidated uh, on a single tool set uh, about probably six months, maybe even a year before COVID. Uh, it was a slow transition to tell everybody. Uh, and in uh, uh, all full disclosure, I used to work at Adobe, so I shouldn't say this, but you're no longer allowed to use Illustrator or Photoshop uh, for your comps. <laughs> it just, you can only use Figma. Um, so we all consolidated on one platform and as a result, um, sharing work uh, and working collaboratively became much easier. We also had, uh, it was a free for all uh, in terms of communication and we all uh, consolidated on Slack. Uh, if we hadn't done those two things, the transition would have been terrible. Um, but as a result of all being the same virtual space, essentially, uh, the transition has been um, quite smooth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I totally understand that. You know, at SCAD, we, we had a robust uh, online delivery system for, for a long time before all of this happened. So it really helped us to be able to switch gear quickly and, and adapt very quickly and, and seamlessly for our, for our students and our faculty. Caitlin, um, you, you've been a long, you know, longstanding writer uh, in your career. How, how do you see the way um, that you talk about new products and tech over time? How's that changing you know, with different types of media platforms and so forth? Um, I think for a long time, there was just a real sense of excitement about technology and not a lot of skepticism about how technology could be maybe misused if in the wrong hands. Um, and I think, I think it took a long time to get to that point, both 
both from a journalist standpoint and also a consumer standpoint, like just because this smart speaker makes my life easier, okay, well, what about the, the privacy drawbacks, right? So I think, I think both journalists and consumers are getting better at asking those questions like, okay, this thing seems incredibly cool, but what does it mean if, if the tech is phased out in a year, then that's not useful for anyone, right? You shouldn't spend hundreds or thousands of dollars on this. Um, and, and I think we're just getting better at asking those questions and consumers are just getting a lot savvier. Like they know what they want, they have a ton of choice and they're not willing to settle for something that might be, um, you know, terrible, <laughs> essentially. Right, right, definitely. Well, I, I want to, you know, kind of um, piggybacking on this, I want to ask the three of you for, for advice and, and guidance. What, what do you think the top skills designers and creative leaders who are going to need to move on and to respond to this kind of uh, quickly evolving, uh, you know, technology and, and trends that we're seeing? I, I don't think the skills that uh, designers need have changed. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I think there is a, a stronger and stronger case for uh, design as a core part of any uh, process of creation. Uh, it's because the, the two base skills, craft and empathy, are, mm -hmm. are the same skills from, I don't know, 100 years ago. Uh, now sometimes we get away from them because we get so excited about learning some esoteric skill that might map directly uh, to a specific technology or a specific area of interest. Um, but it's never really changed. Um, you need strong craft. You need to be able to draw, um, to be able to think all the way around the object, and to be able to share uh, your thinking. Um, to create richer collaboration with the people who don't draw. And then you have to be an empath. If you can't step into somebody else's shoes, um, then you can't design for them. Um, and I like that, I, the, the, the fact that it's it will always be the same core skills. Mm -hmm. Grace? I would say, yeah, I, I would say that there's a there's a problem solving skill that's also really critical to today's designers, right? And so there's the practical kind of core skills that Mike was was referring to, right? That you, you have to be able to understand craft and, and, and understand the consumer. But then I think there's also the piece of taking that insight, translating it to a real of to a real experience. That's a problem that they're solving. Designers are 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 constantly solving a problem because even if you have the technology it the experience of utilizing that technology might not be um, ideal and that's another problem like i think that mentality of of always seeking to solve a problem is um, a quality that i see in a lot of great designers mm -hmm. um, just to supplement yeah. right caitlin what, what do you think yeah, I agree. That problem solving thinking is something that I think obviously comes in handy, especially especially now when you know we're kind of saturated with a lot of different types of products and services. Um, you know, there there was a while when it was just like an on demand delivery service was like the only thing that people could conceive of. And okay, now that we can get literally anything we want delivered to us, what's what's the next like? That's not a problem that needs to be solved anymore. So I think we need creative people who can see where the problems are. And maybe if they can't fix them entirely because the issue could be systemic, um, you know, at least figure out what do, what do people need? Like, what are people struggling with? You know, whether it's childcare or healthcare, you know, things that are bigger issues than just, can I get food to me quickly, quickly? You know, like, I think, I think designers are, are in um, a much better place than most people in terms of how they think to solve those problems. That's great. great. And Kaylin, earlier, um, Grace was mentioning this, uh, the future of, of AR, VR, um, you know, at, at the at the CES show and how, how that's playing such an integral part in, in the way that products and experiences are, 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 are being um, revealed and experienced through the consumer. Uh, at SCAD, we, we also have... Um, 
a very uh, very popular immersive reality degree. So can you can you share with us what you're seeing out in industry relating to this this uh, part of the profession and what's what are the trends that are happening with immersive reality? Yeah, so um, I think I think virtual reality um, has definitely struggled to move beyond just the gaming element, mm -hmm. um, and and I think there's there's a lot involved to that. So first, you know, for a long time, VR headsets were tethered to a really powerful PC, which automatically put a barrier to entry, and now that's that's um, definitely diminished. Um, but also just convincing people to wear this massive thing on their head for any length of time like a lot of people just are never going to want to do that so obviously gaming and entertainment is the natural path for virtual reality and maybe maybe we'll see more in terms of um, education and, and healthcare. care um, but i think augmented reality is really exciting because you know you can you can use AR on your phone, you can use AR in a pair of glasses, like you're not limited to strapping this thing on top of your head. Um, and a lot of companies are rumored to be working on a lot of different things. Um, you know, Google Glass obviously is now being used in, in commercial spaces, which makes a ton of sense. Um, so I think we'll see a lot more of that. But um, in terms of consumer AR, Again, I think that's that's a design problem that mm -hmm. that needs to be solved because a lot of um, the challenge to convincing people to you know wear glasses, for instance, is that yeah. they look really weird and they creep people out. So how do you design around that? How do you take something that could be really useful and make it cool and fun to wear? You know, making it more personal for people. So um, yeah, I think I think we're gonna see a lot of movement on that front in the next, you know, two to five years. Yeah, that, I mean, that's such a great point. I love that. I, I think it speaks to what, what Grace and Michael were speaking about. So you can have all this advanced technology, but it comes back to, you know, these, these core fundamental things that continue to transcend time and technology, which is, like you said, even comfort, right? Or, or mm -hmm. what your perception of me is when I'm wearing a certain type of glass or, you know, glasses or so forth. And, and that's, uh, yeah. that seems really amazing. Um, I'm going to ask if you guys could kind of share with us uh, what you know each of your companies are doing, and 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 if you can give us a sneak peek at, at what we can expect. Hmm. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Who can share? I, I can share. Um, so we, I mean, we 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 have so many categories at Samsung. It's um, and we launch a ton of stuff every year. So I can speak specifically to my category, um, which is home entertainment. And I'll, I'll, and I'll limit it to TV because I love TV. <laughs> TV is so fun. Right. Um, we're launching a couple of things. So just one note that we saw this year, a lot of folks went from like viewing content on their mobile devices to viewing together because they were with their families all day. Um, and so we saw a lot of large screen usage um, and we, brought the micro LED TV, which we, la we launched at CES last year, two years ago, actually, it was 292 inch TV. Obviously nobody's gonna bring the wall into their home, but we are launching a consumer version of it um, that doesn't require a complicated install. It's just a one piece out of the box um, product. And that was, you know, a lot of that of rushing and escalating that was because we saw so many families, you know, taking on one, like more group viewing habits, but also trying to recreate theater experiences that had shut down. So that's really exciting for us to be able to offer a, a you know, a real consumer version of that. And it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Um, we're launching a, a series of mini LED TVs. Um, basically, LCD is backlight driven. I'm not going to go into the tech, it's too complicated, <laughs> but it's basically going to be brighter, better contrast, more immersive. But what's cool is the guts of the TV. So the panel's gorgeous, um, but the guts of the TV brings a ton of new kind of more service and experience related uh, features like an AI trainer that will like give you real time, you know, form feedback as you're working out. Mm -hmm. um, that game bar that we were talking about, um, video conferencing directly from your TV. So you don't have to like cast and go through multiple devices anymore. So 
it's cool because it's very much stuff that we really need this year. Um, kind of supplementing like the the outward beautiful content because we know people are just watching a ton of yeah. of me, um, for lots of reasons. Right. So that that's yeah. those are our big ones. And then so, we're making frame more frame like. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and I was going to ask you too, Grace. What what's the future of the remote? Is it going to be around? <laughs> much longer what's going on with that oh my gosh we're launching a solar remote it's so wow. exciting um so it's the first in our industry uh it's made of all recyclable materials but it's also got a solar panel um instead of using regular batteries because we're we sell a ton of tvs just even globally um the impact of pulling out those batteries and replacing them and throwing them in landmines is just massive yeah. So I'm I'm really excited. That's probably I'm surprised that I didn't because I'm always like we're doing solar guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always talking about the sustainability piece. Um, I'm really excited about it. I think one of the things about being home with our families this year was you just like really think about the world that you're leaving behind for your kids. Um, yeah. And I think technology is proliferating. Everybody's got so many devices. What are we doing to to proliferate responsibly, right? So you can have all those devices and tech gadgets to like make your life easier, but let's think about the repercussions of that too. Um, so, yeah, no, and and, and yeah, thanks for, for bringing yeah. that up. No, that's well, you know, in my household, it's this constant struggle between me and my nine year old son who gets the remote. I'm hoping you get the technology in, in place where it helps me uh, give me an advantage uh, very soon. Well, we also have the remote <laughs> in our phones, so even if our kids have the remote, they're like, Why does the TV keep turning off? I'm like, I don't know, it's buggy today. Right. <laughs> Maybe you should go outside and play, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> Um, Michael, what what can we expect from Uber? What, what exciting things are going on? I'm not following Grace. There's no way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Samsung's doing so many amazing things. We, we, we really are trying hard uh, to be essentially, I'd say, like a two-note company. We're either trying to get people from point A to point B, um, or we're trying to get things from point A to point B. Uh, the what you can look for on the horizon is getting from point A to point B in more and more ways. Uh, we're invested heavily in connecting to transit systems. Um, we think that trains and buses and planes and uh, subways are such a key part of uh, any transportation network. Uh, and uh, we want uh, our existing solutions to connect to those seamlessly, like I talked about before. Um, and as uh, autonomous, or flying cars or submarines or any other new method of transportation comes along, we want to just be ready to connect to it um, because each transportation solution has slightly different requirements. Uh, on the courier side, uh, we started with restaurants, we started with eats um, and we've moved into grocery and we're looking at pharmacy and uh, more and more, we're just going to connect all of the services, local ones, um, so that your local businesses, uh, the ones that you like to frequent physically, you can also do, you know, essentially virtually. Uh, and uh, that is expanding rapidly, especially in COVID times. Um, in fact, we're having a hard time keeping up with the amount of business uh, we're getting. Uh, it'll get... I guess sexier, not uh, Samsung sexy, <laughs> but sexier over time as you look at the interconnections. Um, and now we're just scratching the surface. Uh, so when does food or some other service intersect with transportation? Um, do you want to book an entire day and do your shopping that way? Uh, do you want coffee delivered to your car in route, um, those kinds of connections uh, will start happening uh, more and more. That that would be unbelievable if my my coffee is waiting at my, my office as I come in already ready to go. That would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, what, what are you seeing? What, what are our companies or products that you, you see that um, you want to champion or you want to tell us all about? 
I mean, obviously we're, we're covering all of that. We definitely covered the, the Samsung TVs and the solar remote. Everyone was super excited about that because having one less thing that needs charging <laughs> when, when you have so much to charge is a, right. is a godsend. Um, and this year we're seeing a lot of um, on-demand home fitness, I think has been mm -hmm. just a huge trend. Um, so I recently, you know, reviewed the new Peloton. They have an, another new product coming this year. Um, and I think there's a lot of excitement around that because not only um, not only is home fitness become essential, obviously, when you can't go to the gym, but it's also just giving people something to do, something to plan their days around. Okay, so you work from home, you have to work out at home, but that can become like a, something exciting and it doesn't have to be something that you dread. You know, it just breaks up your day a little bit. So we're, we're seeing a lot of that. Um, and... Yeah, everything else is just pretty, pretty practical. Um, you know, laptops, phones, there's not a lot of changes there, but everything is getting a lot better. And then I think eventually we'll see a lot more companies follow in Samsung's footsteps with the foldables. Um, I think those are getting better every year. And um, I don't know, we might we might see some some other big companies go in that direction if you know, consumers show that they're interested in that, which um, I think that they have so far. Um, so that'll be really interesting because we haven't seen a lot of changes in phones for a while. So yeah, that's what we're looking forward to. That's great. And you talked about this home fitness thing. I, I, I saw recently this, this um, new one, the mirror, I think it's a, I think it's mm -hmm. another one. And what I love about it is of course, it's about, you know, fitness, but it ties you into a community. So, you know, mm -hmm. you don't feel so isolated at home anymore. So it's it's a workout, but it's also a sense of kind of being able to socialize in a, in a way that, you know, technology is making it possible to do in this time when we're all kind of at home quarantining ourselves. So it's pretty yeah, exactly. It's a little it's a little different than just like watching a YouTube video. Right. Like, I mean, obviously you can do that, too, and it's free. But, right. you know, just some, it's, it's a little something extra just to you know, make us feel something. <laughs> Social Definitely. hour when we have so few of those outlets, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Definitely. Caitlin, don't forget about the ice cream pods. The ice cream oh. cherry. That's who could forget. Mm. <laughs> you we are about. very we are very you excited about that. that. What is that Can you share that with us? Uh, forget the name of was... the company, Caitlin, I'll let you but there's there's a company yeah. that basically created ice cream pods that you do soft serve from. Wow. Yeah, it's a Keurig for ice cream, which you know, I'm I'm on the fence about. I'm I'm not a Keurig person myself, but if it was for ice cream, I might I might be convinced. <laughs> yeah, we haven't tried that out yet. So we're committed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's amazing. Any flavor you want, that's on demand. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Innovation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> while working out and so forth. Yeah, it has yeah, a Bluetooth yeah. connection. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I'm gonna. Um, I'd love to do a couple rapid fire questions to you. See what you, you're thinking, top of mind, and and so um, no order, but uh, uh, you know, I'd love for each of you to to, to let us know what what is your um, what is your go to app right now on your phone. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting one because my phone used to be the center of my universe, but now I don't go anywhere. So uh, <laughs> it's become a music. It's Sonos. That's, that's what I use it for. Mm. Yeah, for me, it's question, sleep Adam. cycle. I'm like a really bad sleeper, so it shames me into trying to sleep more and better. Yeah. I think for me, it's just all the messaging apps. Like I have all of them, and I have different group chats on on each one, and they're extremely difficult to corral. But that's definitely like keeping me connected with you know, friends, family across the country and, um, you know, video calls, obviously a huge way to stay connected. So I'm definitely doing a lot more messaging, I think, than I used to. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, what about um, new uh, at home devices? What should we all be running out and buying immediately in, for the home? Neo QLED TV. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I set that up for you guys. I don't know. Yeah, you should. Sure <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do that for Grace. I, I, the jury's a little bit out, but the aura ring and the data I'm getting, because I'm also a terrible sleeper, I'm trying to go through the data and understand it. And I think it's helping me sleep better, but 
like I said, the jury's out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think wearable devices right now are really helpful for a lot of people. You know, you don't realize how sedentary you can be when you're stuck in. Like I, you know, when I get a reminder that I need to go for a walk that I've just been sitting down all day, like that's actually really helpful because otherwise I would just stay here <laughs> and not move. Um, so I think I think we're seeing a lot of movement in wearables and also just speakers. Like people want to listen to music in their house and they want to have different music playing in different rooms. So we're seeing a lot of that. Um, and speakers are becoming so affordable these days. Like you don't have to splurge to get really amazing sound. So that's been cool. That's great. Mike, I, I, you, you brought up a really interesting uh, point and I want to ask the three of you your opinion. Is there going to be a point where we're oversaturated with information? You know, you're talking about you don't have time to go through all of the, the information about your uh, that the ring is giving you. How, how do you know, where's the balance in that? How do we how do we deal with, you know, all these devices giving us so much information all the time? Uh, is there is there kind of a, a way to edit that or a way to deal with that? Caitlin probably has a more structured point of view on this because she looks at it more. We're, we're the problem, not the solution. <laughs> so, uh, that is true. Know, that is very true. <laughs> we crossed that point of uh, data saturation some years ago. Yeah. Like, there's definitely too much, and now we have to make hard choices. Right. Yeah, I think it's really on the individual to curate what's most important to them. And there's way to do that in, in terms of, you know, the apps that you use or time limits you set for yourself. You can have your device set time limits on you if you have absolutely no self-control, which, you know, I, I can't judge. Yeah. Um, but I think we have definitely, we crossed that line quite some time ago and now we're just, we're just trying to do our best with it at this point. <laughs> right, right, great. Um, what's, the, what's the one product you guys cannot live without? And Grace, you cannot say the Samsung TV. <laughs> <laughs> From now on, every response. Will be, yeah. Samsung TV. <laughs> My yeah. air fryer, probably. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't have one yet, but but I've heard I've heard it's a must. Yeah. So I'm gonna have to get one. I actually so okay. Big shout out to Ninja Foodie because my old go to was the Instant Pot, mm -hmm. and it now has an instant pot and an air fryer in one mm -hmm. oh, it is okay. the ultimate kitchen like i don't know it's just as a mom of three kids who work yes like yeah. dinner in 30 minutes or less every single night and it's good yeah yeah, yeah. you can stick a whole chicken in there i'm not kidding <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> the miracle it's not, machine i hear you uh, we we discovered this thing literally like two weeks ago and it's been <laughs> We've not eaten so much vegetable in our in in the house. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, I, yeah. <laughs> Michael, what what about you? Uh, it's we already talked about it before, but the Peloton's definitely become kind of the center of uh, maybe not the center of the home, but it's that necessary other experience, other place. I I don't know what we would do without it right now. Um, maybe argue and fight more. Uh, <laughs> that's it. It's pretty important. Yeah, agreed. It, it's it's been. Um, I mean, I'm in LA, which is kind of like the COVID central of America right now, and everything's been locked down for a really long time. So yeah, having the Peloton, like my husband and I, like have our separate, you know, schedules on it and our different classes, and then we can compare notes after. Like, was that class great? Who's your favorite instructor? It's just it's definitely become like a separate space, even though it's in the center of everything. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that's been really useful for a lot of people. That's great, great. Well, thank you so much for uh, for being here and sharing your thoughts and, and sharing your viewpoints about uh, tech and what's what the future uh, brings to us. Grace, Michael, Caitlin, thank you so much for being here. We hope mm -hmm. uh, you were able to take a glimpse into the future of tech and, and thank you again to all our panelists for their insights and their sharing of their experience.